Good morning. Uh, this is Tom Simpson with uh, McHenry County Conservation District. I'm the field station ecologist and welcome to Tom Talks. Today we're going to uh, look at the spring, spring plants, mostly our, our forests and woodlands in the county, some savanna plants and a few of those drift out into meadows here and there. We'll be talking mostly about the spring ephemeral plants of the woodland. Um, one of the things I have to apologize for ahead of time is you really can't do many plants in a short workshop like this. So you'll see plants out there in the woods that you won't see covered in this workshop today. I, but uh, hopefully this will give you a stop in learning how to learn about plants. Uh, and uh, yeah, with that, we'll, we'll get going here. Aw, why does spring come so early? Comes early every year, dude. You had all winter to rest. But how can I sleep at the chorus? Ah. Nice, nice, but tone it down. Ah. I wish everyone could just get along. Let's all have a big group hug. Ew. Floral resources department here. Before we risk any leaf to leaf touching here, let's just remember the three safety rules for floral interaction. All sap and root exudate exchange is potentially dangerous. Number two, floral contact risks micro abrasions to epidermal tissues. And number three, just because we can't see your roots doesn't mean it's not dangerous to touch. Wouldn't be a day in the woods without hearing from the FR department. Mandatory training today at noon. The benefits of symbiotic relationships. Now that's working together. Coming up next week, the many dangers of self-pollination. Oh. Ouch. Actually, please refrain from all pollen, aka seed, exchange in the workplace. Da -da. What's a little pollen between friends? Hybridization. <gasps> I'm going back to sleep. With that introduction, uh... I think a lot of times today we think of sort of the age of ecological restoration, really um, um, increased awareness of native plants probably over the last 30 years. Some of you who are a bit older, like myself, I remember when that was, was a bit more marginal to the whole conservation issue, but we certainly emphasize that today. But if you look back in time, you see that that was always a minor theme uh, in uh, on July 15th, 1930, last week, more than 30 varieties of blossoms were shown. Um, the exhibit uh, at the uh, Crystal Lake, um, what was it, the Crystal Lake um, hey, Tom. Corner Shop. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, an idea that it is evergreen. It keeps circulating around in society. It's just uh, raised in its um, profile today. Hey, Tom, we're going to stop. A just quick tech issue. Um, okay. The screen seems to be a little bit fuzzy, so maybe stop sharing your screen and reshare it without uh, checking those boxes to optimize for the video. Okay. Let's see. How about that? That looks better. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let's talk a little, just a little bit to start off with about flowers. Some of you, this is a uh, old, old hat and for other of you, you've never really looked inside of a flower. You may even know the names of a few, uh, species, but you've never really looked inside of the flower. Um, it's rather more structured and with us for about a hundred million years. Uh, it's a, it's an, it's an ancient structure and the parts are always the same and they're always in the same relationship to one another, though some of them may be missing, uh, have dropped out in evolutionary time. You never add any, any parts really to modify these, these four, which start off with the sepal on the outside, then the petal, both of which are sterile. They don't have any direct reproductive function of the, the stamens, which are the male part of the flower, and then the pistil, or here labeled the carpal, that is the female part. So I'll be using those words over and over again. Uh, 
in this presentation, just try to remember where they fit into the overall flower structure. Now, the word carpal is probably not as familiar as the word pistil. It's probably used more by botanists today. Pistil is sort of faded out. There's a 25 cent word, gynesium, that would mean the same thing, or the collection of all female parts in the flower. The carpal is a uh, is the original structure in the, with the evolution of the flower, all those parts, sepal, petal, stamen, and, and pistil are all modified leaves. Here the leaf was folded over. You can see the, the arrangement of seeds in a legume pod along one, one axis, and it, the, you can imagine the leaf folded over, spilled along its edge. That's a simple carp of a flowering plant preserved today in, in all the legumes. But for the most part, those carpels can be many, many ones, like in, in many of our things we do in the buttercup family, we'll have uh, over a dozen carpels, with all of which mature to a little nutlet called nakeen. Uh, they may be fused together as in uh, uh, a, um, a lily pod, uh, a three-lobed pod with seeds inside. So the individual carpal isn't as easily visible as it is in the legume, but it's there, it's there sort of an evolutionary sense in all plants. So we'll talk about, I'll, I'll use that word a number of times today. And the, the symmetry of the flower, most of our flowers are here called lactomorphic. I'll probably just use radially symmetric and bilaterally symmetric for these two, but if I, if I digress in fancy words, zygomorphic is for like violets, and mints have this flower that's symmetrical around a plane through the center. This is really centric around a center point. And this big division in plants between dicots and monocots. Dicots are the more ancient of the two groups. Uh, they have net veined or feather veined leaves. Uh, the flower parts are generally in fours and fives. I mean, exceptions to all these rules. Uh, and if, you, uh, if you've ever planted lima beans in the garden and watched them when they germinate and pop up above ground, the first thing you see are these two thick uh, organs that looks maybe a little bit like leaves, but not really. They're, they're the cotyledons, the seeds of the plant. And there are two of them in all dicots. Not all of them are raised up above ground like that where they're easily visible, but in the seed, there are two cotyledons and in the stem, the vascular tissue is arranged in little bundles in a, in a siphon-like arrangement. The 25 cent word for that is siphonosteel. So you gotta re remember these fancy words to impress family and friends at dinner tonight. The monocots uh, have the vascular bundles arranged just randomly through a, a, a stem, otherwise sort of pulpy. If you stop at a harvested cornfield and look where they where the the uh, combine has cut the corn plant off. You'll see a sort of pulpy mass, with little vascular strands, and that's a classic monocot arrangement. The veins are parallel in the leaves. Really thought that the original sort of dicot, aquatic dicot ancestor it was reduced to just a stems, photosynthetic stems, and the stems widened out in parallel vein leaves of the monocot. Um, flower parts are in threes. Um, yeah, so, so we'll see, there's, there's, there are always exceptions to these rules, but they're good rules to go by when you're looking at plants. So let's start looking at a few of the species we're going to do today. Um, we're going to start off with the monocops. This is the wild leek. And it's uh, especially a uh, commentary. What you're going to see often and right now is this uh, plant on the right-hand side with these thick green leaves, um, bunches of them, you know, any leaves coming up from a common flowers will come up a little bit later, but the woods are just alive with these big bunches of leek leaves. Uh, I'm told that the word shikam is the Aquan Indian word for, uh, for leek. Uh, the story perhaps apocryphal was the French voyageurs and their Indian guides will walk through those and the leeks and stepping on them and it makes quite a smell. Everything in the onion group uh, in the group Allium uh, has that same strong oniony odor. And the French Frenchman asked the Indian, what is the place? And the Indian thought they were asking about the smell. 
and replied with a name for the leak, which was then corrupted into the word Chicago. So that maybe maybe that's true, maybe not. But anyway, let's get the flowers of Monica. Now there are three sepals and three petals, but there's so much alike here with monocots, we just call them tepals. We'll get a close up of a few of these monocot flowers where you can see there's an inner whorl and an outer whorl. So they correspond to the sepals and petals, but they're simply called tepals when they look exactly alike. The flowers are wrapped in a tumble. So each of the flowers is on a stalk and all the stalks join together right at the, at the same point. We call that flower arrangement a tumble. We'll run into that again when we do some plants in, in uh, the carrot family, or what used to be called the umbilifera. There's a and they uh, form a capsule when they're when they're mature, little black capsules, many tiny seeds inside. The uh, another onion uh, common in the woods, in, in my experience, not quite as common as the leeks, but common in the woods. Again, you see the three sepals, three petals of, of the wild onion, sometimes called wild garlic. In this case, the leaves are very thin and long, almost grass-like in texture, but if either one of them, if you just tear the leaf a little bit and crush it in your fingers, you get a very strong oniony odor. Um, what are these things here? Here's the flowers, they've got all same and pistol, all complete up here, and they all join together in this umbel, but what are these big, bulb-like things here. But those are bulbs. They're actually, they're a sort of asexual means of reproduction. So if that falls over, the bulb -like can then germinate and grow into another plant. Sometimes the bulbs will germinate when they're still on the plant and you'll see little shoots coming out of the bulblet. But this is not the ovary of the flower. It's actually a, a separate reproductive mechanism on the, on the wild onion. And you see that on many, many of the onions. Uh, this is one of those really, really common, the white trout, Lelonium albidum, one of the really common um, wildflowers of our woods, often uh, growing in big masses like that. And that's because it, repro that's because it reproduces vegetatively. Um, it has the three, here you can see, here the, the sepals, there, there, and there. It's the outer world and the inner row of these three, but they like, so we call them tepals, six tepals, six stamens. In the ovary of three carpels. Remember in the monocots we have things in threes, multiples of three. Here the, the leaf, a sort of simple uh, um, elongate leaf with model, I guess like, like a trout, brook trout have that sort of model surface to them. Here the flower generally angles down and the petals are reflex or petals and sepals reflexed upwards. So a very pretty flower. Many of the Many of the leaves that you see in the woods won't have flowers because when, they, when, the, when the shoot first comes in the ground for the first few years, it's not in the court, doesn't have enough stored food, so it doesn't flower. But in, a, in an older stand of trout lilies, you'll see lots of flowers. So one of the curious things about trout lilies is that they uh, have uh, seeds that are um, that have a little, well, the seeds are only for about, fertile about 10% of the time, or are viable about 10% of the time, even when pollinated. Uh, so they rely a lot on vegetative reproduction, but the seeds have a little thing attached to them called the eliasome, which is attracted to ants, and then ants grab the seed and disperse it for trout lily. The whole, I'm gonna try to pronounce this, that process is called myrmecockery, um, and it's an uh, ant dispersal of seeds, one of those fascinating behind the scenes things that's going on in nature that you never knew about. Uh, the smooth Solomon seal is a common uh, hey, plant of our woodlands. Here it's growing out in the meadow and smooth Solomon seal can do both. It can grow in the woods, in which case it's generally about a foot tall, very delicate little flower and the same, the same species grows out in the meadow or gets lots of sunlight and it'll be up over almost a waist high sometimes uh, in a big robust plant. Um, when we look more closely at the smooth Solomon seal, you can see the parallel vein leaves of the monocot. So simply because the leaves are parallel vein doesn't mean they're grass-like in overall shape. Here they're, they're uh, sort of ovate uh, shape. The parallel doesn't mean parallel like in geometry, it only means the veins starting one point and they end in one point at the leaf tip. And the leaves of 
smooth salmon and seal have that pretty bluish green color with a sort of white haze to them. It's the, it's the, the wax on the surface of the leaf. I think I went over that in the, in the tree, uh, the, the, the winter tree thing we did a few weeks back. It's called the epicuticular wax of the cuticle wax. And the, the flowers uh, mature into these, uh, it's, it's three carpels again, fused into a berry-like fruit this time in the uh, lily family. Well, I need to get rid of this, don't I? There. How do I? Anyway. Um, so uh, smooth Solomon seal, there's another plant in the woods that, that um, often mistaken, this is the false Solomon seal. It's unfortunate that some of our flowers have the word false in them. It's sort of like they're not who they say they are, but it's, you know, it's just someone said it looks like a Solomon seal and said, no, it's the false Solomon seal. This is a different genus, Smilocyna. Uh, and you can see the flowers, which were in the leaf axles with the smooth Solomon seal have moved to the end of the, the, end of the plant here in a sort of panic-like arrangement. Similar six petal or six tepals, uh, six stamens, a three carpellated ovary that uh, matures into a berry like fruit. Fruits sort of start off goldy in color and they end up almost ruby red. And this is sort of in between those two. Um, when, when you don't have flowers present, the way to tell these two apart is a more yellow green color of the false elements. I was more deeply impressed. Than in the uh, at least that really stands out as I'm walking down the trail. The color and the and the the the, the surface texture of, of, of the top of the leaf. And we've got another smile assignment we're going to do today called the false starry false Solomon seal, spinal sinus stellata or star-like. You can see here the flowers are fewer in number, again, at the, at the end of the plant, at the terminus of the, of its growth. Uh, and the flowers are somewhat larger, and so you can appreciate the more star-like shape of them. Uh, not much difference in the individual flowers, but the flowers here are fewer in number and larger, so giving them that star-like appearance. The easy way to tell this from a false Solomon seal, plain false Solomon seal, is that the leaves are more closely spaced, so more differently oriented. To my eye, a little more blue-green in color than yellow-green. Here you can see the stark uh, shape. In general, the, the starry fault Solomon seal leaves are narrow in, narrow, narrower in relation to their length. They make flowers mature into the red berries, just as the false one does. And here are the smooth and, and the plain fault Solomon seal right together. Narrower leaves, more closely uh, arranged along the stem, both of them flowering at the tip. Uh, and the, the false Solomon seal generally leans over and has the, the leaves are sort of held at right, right or, or parallel to the ground. Just a different overall look to the plant. If you're used to that, they're pretty easy to tell apart. Another monocot, this one maybe at first glance, not looking for monocot at all, but again, parallel vein. Here the veins start, they loop around and end at the tip. Uh, that, that's, that's what parallel means in botany. Again, three sepal, three petal, six stamens, three carpellate ovary. We can see that here, this, the, the sepals are angled downward, sharply down the petal, almost straight up. And the stamens, really the stamens are this large anther. That's the pollen bearing part of the stamen black. So actually, while the red is not a very bright, colorful red, the overall color scheme is quite attractive here with the, with the, the green, the, the, the muted red color and those black anthers uh, surrounding the ovary in the center, which matures into this fleshy fruit. Uh, if you pop it open, it's sort of like a fleshy capsule. So it's somewhere between a berry and a capsule, if you wanted the formal name for that. Usually the books just call it a fleshy fruit. So this is a prairie trillium, trillium recurvatum, grows in the woods, but also grows out into open savannas and even out into meadows. Our most widely distributed trillium in the Chicago area. Oh, we've got a quiz here. So 
So what are we looking at here? There and there. You can write to your box and there and there and there and there and there and there and there. What are those modeled leaves? You're the trout lily. I don't know how many of you got that one right, but I imagine many of you did. We had quite a few um, in the chat were found with trout lily. So good job, guys. Um, here we're going to look at, I, I always impressed me, I don't know why this one stands out, I don't see it very often, sometimes the things you don't see very often become special. This is the bellwort, in some books they'll call it the large flower bellwort, that's what grandiflora means. Uh, flower structure is being, becoming pretty repetitive, six tepals, six stamens, a three carpellate over, it's in the lily family. Um, the, the flower here, you can see it, it's a, uh, you can see again the inner world and outer world, but otherwise sepals and petals alike extends on the inside. And here is the is both the fruit and the leaves. Now the leaves here are what's called perfoliate. The stem punches through the bay leaf, uh, rather quite unusual. Uh, and here is that the three-lobed capsule that developed from the Greek carpal ovary. Yeah, flowers pendant, uh, sort of yeah. A very graceful plant. It's a it's a joy to see this one in the woods in the springtime. Back in the pulpit, which is probably gets the, my vote for the most unusual monocot. I kept checking. They even that doesn't I mean that looks like a feather vein leaf to me, and yet this is classed as a monocot. Here, this modified leaf, the spade that surrounds the spadix in these plants, looks parallel vein. Leaves less so. One guesses the vascular structure and the morphology of the seed in form botanist that's actually a monocot. This is one of our stranger wildflowers in terms of its reproduction. The uh, spadix in the center of the flower, this again, this is the spade, the big hood that surrounds the leaf, um, has positions for both male and female flowers, but only one is functional in any one jack in the pulpit. Um, and so the plants functionally are either male or female. What happens is that the young plants are male and as they mature, in subsequent years they become female. Uh, there's no noticeable odor to the plant, but it actually, this is, this is, a, this is a cool story. Um, it actually makes a smell that's, that's, has a, is fungal in, in, its, in its smell to these fungal gnats. The fungal gnats lay their eggs on fungi, but they're fooled and they go down into the jack in the pulpit flower in order to lay their eggs on a fungus and they re realize there's no fungus down here. They try to get out. The, the walls are very slick. The hood tends to bounce some of them back into the funnel and they fall down on the males and they fall and they brush against the stamens. Uh, there's generally a little pile of pollen down here at the bottom. They get thoroughly dusted by pollen, but if they keep trying, they eventually find there's a little hole in the bottom of the of the spade that allows the gnats to escape. Well, the gnats aren't especially right, and so they fly to the next jack in the pulpit, which could be a female, and do the same thing over again. They fly in looking for fungi, and uh, and again they're fooled. Uh, but they can't get out again. This time, as they fall down to the bottom, they brush against the stigmas of the female flowers and, uh, and pollinate the flower. Unfortunately for the gnats, the, the, uh, the female flower doesn't have any interest, or the flower, the plant, doesn't have any interest in letting the gnats out again, so the gnats end up dying inside of the female as they try again and again to get out and fall down against the female flowers, they just assure the, the plant that those female flowers are going to be pollinated. So here is a is a um, one of those symbiotic relationships that doesn't work out very well for one of the partners. And then and the flower, the little uh, ovaries mature into these. Uh, Berries that are eaten by birds. I've been told they're deadly poisonous to people. Once I'm told that, I don't taste them. So uh, I don't know exactly how poisonous they are, but birds do eat them and move them around. Jack and the uh, green dragon is another member of that same group. 
Uh, the the symmetry of the leaves of Jack in the Pulpit I find uh, beautiful. I top there's two sort of branches that arch out in either direction and leaves come off. The symmetry of this reminds me of the symmetry of maiden hair fern, which is my favorite fern. I don't know quite how to describe the symmetry of it, but it's uh, yeah, I find that's the most the most beautiful thing about Jack in the Pulpit. The hood looks very much like, or excuse me, green dragon. The hood looks very much like Jack in the Pulpit, but this time the spadix, or this this part, which is called the appendix, is lengthened into this long tongue that sticks way out of the flower. And I guess this must be more attractants for the fungal fungal gnats again. That's that's my only guess. I could have explanation of what, what the spadix is doing way out there. You could come up with all sorts of fanciful answers to that. Uh, it matures into, into a cluster of, uh, of berries, much like with Jack in the pulpit. Fascinating family of plants that are raised. Now we're going to move into the dicots. The spring beauty is, uh, is every time I look at this, I remember my, the, the teacher who really got me interested in ecology. And it was right at a time when I was learning wildflowers. His name was Russ Curry. He was in the college page and did page count. And, uh, and this was his favorite spring wildflower. It's funny how you remember those things. A uh, beautiful little flower, uh, pink with dark pink veins in, in the petals. Uh, just a gorgeous flower. The leaves are long, sort of strap-like. Very delicate flower, narrow, fleshy leaves. If you feel them between your fingers, it's sort of a succulent feel to it. And it's in the succulent family of Portulacaceae. If you have a garden, uh, you probably have purslane. Probably purslane is one of the weeds you pull out of the garden. If you leave it in the garden, you can eat it. It's a nice salad green, but it's the aggressive weed, thick, fleshy, much shorter leaves than this, but thick, fleshy leaves, which to me have a slightly salty taste to it. Um, but the spring beauty, pretty abundant wildflower in our woods. The uh, toothwort is, uh, is a member of the mustard family or the brassicaceae. And this is a big family of plants, many of them in our region, many weeds. A lot of the weeds are weeds of agricultural areas and open, but we have a few important weeds of woodlands I'll, I'll talk about today. This is the toothwort um, that, that Teeth referring to the teeth on the leaflets of the leaf with the, uh, what in some books is called the cut leaf tooth wart. The teeth is very deeply the uh to the base, almost looking like a compound leaf. Uh, but this is the neat thing about the mustard family are the flowers. The flowers are always this four sepal, four, four petal, six stamens, four long, two short, and a two carpellate ovary is a, is a uh, Amazing standard when we look up, whoops, let's go forward again here. Look up and we'll see, we'll see this repeated again with the mustard family flowers. Uh, just, and as uh, two parts grow in masses on the forest floor, probably they're, they're clonely reproducing underground. I'm not sure on that. Here's another uh, mustard family plant. And we can see here that four petal flower again. If you just commit that flower to memory, they can be large, they can be small, they can be generally yellow or white, sometimes a little bit bluish or violet in color. But if you commit that flower to memory, all mustard flowers look alike, they just change in, in size and, and color. Uh, so it's an easy family to recognize. And learning to recognize families is really important as a uh, if you, when you graduate a little and you get to using keys for plants, starting in the front of the book and being out all plant families means you have to go through so many cutouts you almost never get to the end. Whereas you know the family often and that really makes your job a lot easier. So learning to recognize families is a really handy thing. We'll probably have a, a plant family without a plant family work, indoor workshop, they do them lots of uh, this is one of our non-native mustards that are really, really common. If you see old cultivated fields or work sites that have been abandoned this spring and you see masses of yellow flowers in it, it's often the yellow rocket in the early spring. By summer, when you see something very similar, it's a different species of weedy mustard called the black mustard. 
But this time of year, it's the yellow rocket. Again, four petals, four sepals, uh, standard flower shape. Uh, the leaves of the black mustard have this pinnate or like a feather arrangement where you see the lobing, it's symmetrical around the central axis and the lobes then branch off of that central axis. So a pinnately lobed leaf, you can have a pinnately compound leaf like a, a walnut on a walnut tree or here a pinnate lobing on a leaf in many mustards in fact. Um, and mustard. Raise hand for a question from one of our participants. Uh, Renee, okay, do you have a question? Okay, what was the question? Renee, did you have a question? I've unmuted you so you can ask. No, no, okay. Never mind. Go on. <laughs> okay. All right. The the ovary is uh matures into this. Two, two different shapes. Uh, you kind of weedy parts like shepherd purse and penny crest have little flattened disc-like uh, uh, two carpolite structures with many mustards that way that long, long one, uh, and that's called the silique, the, the short disc-like one called the silico, but internally their structure is really very similar. Uh, we have other weeds that are much more pernicious in our area from a natural area's point of view, like the garlic mustard. Again, the, the flower of garlic mustard has that standard four sepal, four petal arrangement. And here is that sleek, that long two carpolate ovary again, with many, many seeds and many, many flowers on any one garlic mustard plant, hundreds, maybe over a thousand seeds on an individual plant. Uh, many of you who have like me, spend a lot of hours pulling these things out of the wood. Woods don't think of them as spring wildflowers, but rather as pests, but they are offspring wildflower from the fact that they do invade these shady woodlands. And something you should learn to recognize if you're just getting into spring wildflowers, this pops up in cities. I see it walking around town the last few weeks working from home. Uh, and if you don't recognize it, it will soon be all, all around your house in shade places. There's the lake sort of pulled apart that central membrane uh, between the two uh, locules. And another a weedy mustard that invades our woods uh, is, is, a, is a sneak invader because it's so pretty people like it and they don't know they should pull it out. I say they should pull it out because it increases its populations very rapidly if you don't recognize it. I just saw it growing outside of my back door this morning. So it happens to all of us. Um, any little shady area can, can get a dame's rocket or a garlic mustard going. Lots of people call this a phlox, and we'll look at phlox later because of a similar color. And, and you know, at, at first glance, it has a phlox like appearance, but the phlox has five petals. This is mustard family, and it has four, so they're easy to tell apart. The leaves in this I'm plant a are. Question are uh, from someone. Go ahead. What's the name of the purse like seed pod structure? The, the name of the long skinny pod is a sleek, and the name of the short disc like pod is a silical in the mustard. So the, 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 uh, the dame's rocket has a, a leaf that looks maybe a little bit like a peach leaf, just a simple, uh, simple pointed and leaf not, not pinnately lobed at all. It's the flowers that give it away as a mustard. And those distinctive fruits that should shout mustard family after those long sleek pods. Another little quiz here. This will test your, you may have our weedy, I'll give you a hint, the weedy mustards. Oh, so how about this one down here? Which is that one? Okay, well that's the garlic mustard. How about this one right here? You can see the flower color. They're not fully open yet. Look at the pinnate arrangement of lobing on, on this leaf and the sort of rounded lobes. That's our yellow rocket. So the yellow rocket is mostly in open areas is in the, around the edges of woods. Garlic mustard really likes it in the shade. Whoops. 
So we're going to move out of the the uh, mustard family into the into the buttercups, a family that has a lot of uh, of, of members in, in our spring flora. Um, remember, I said in the beginning that all all flowering plants have the their flowers have the same parts. It's called a conserved organization that the, because the first flower had a sepal petal stamen pistil arrangement, and in that order. Uh, that's it. All descendants from that original flower have the same parts in the same order, even though some of the parts may be lost. You never find a plant where the stamens are on the inside of the pistil. It's a conserved arrangement. So primitive things tend to be very common things that start off. And with 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 buttercup family plants, most of them are spring blooming. Not all of them. There are always exceptions. But if you just look through. The buttercup family and look at their blooming dates. Most of them are spring blooming, so that's a conserved feature of the original uh, buttercup an ancestor uh, and passed down to most of its descendants. Most of them are spring blooming, and buttercups uh, have this lovely shiny flower. The petals look like they're wet. They're so slick. Any sunlight makes them glisten in a way that looks like they're wet. Um, the, uh, the, the leaves of buttercups, this buttercup are pinnately arranged, you know, pinnately compound. Each of the leaflets sort of shallowly uh, incised with little sinuses, sharp sinuses. Let's look at that in comparison. This one it really grows out into open savannas, uh, more, more open woods in my experience, whereas the swamp buttercup is a little, little more a creature of not really restricted to swamps, but shady woods, it does grow in, into wetter woods also. Here the leaflets are, are more deeply incised, a little more, more you know, sharply toothed around the edges than the, than the early buttercup. Uh, the petals are a little bit broader, that same beautiful shiny uh, color of the, of the yellow petals. Everything in the buttercup, well, Buttercup family is a huge family. Most things in the buttercup family have lots and lots of tear, only five sepals and five petals, but many, many stamens, and then many, many little separate carpels in the middle of the flower, each with its own style and stigma that matures into this bunch of achenes. Um, and achene is just a very small nut-like fruit. So that's a, we're gonna see that over and over again with flowers in the buttercup family. Here's uh, not nearly so showy of a buttercup. You get really close to see those shiny little yellow petals on these small flowered buttercup. Sometimes called the kidney leaf buttercup. We put this picture as here you see the upper leaves are long and skinny and sometimes a little bit branched, but the lower leaves are these broad, I've never actually seen a real kidney, but uh, there's kidney, we call those kidney shaped leaves at the base and then very different looking leaves as the plant grows up. Uh, there you see, and so this is sometimes called the kidney leaf buttercup and sometimes called the small flowered buttercup. Common names are sort of variable depending on which book you look in, Vernacula subordibus. Uh, yeah, this one um, grows up pretty wide. It does grow into, into wetter woods, but also into, into, into drier open Woodland savannas, shady woods, uh, pretty cosmopolitan in its, in its distribution. We were in the buttercup family, but we moved into a different genus, uh, the marsh marigold. Uh, here the petals have disappeared and the cells have taken over the function of petals, you know, five to nine, not, not, as, not a regular number like, like in, in, in most of the ranunculus. But, uh, you can see the flower looks quite similar. Many, many stamens and a number of pistils that, that in this case fuse together into a, a follicle, which is much like a capsule. The distinction between the two is important. So in this case, the carpels fuse together to a follicle when they mature. It's pretty easy to recognize it as a buttercup family. If you didn't know better, you'd call that a member of the genus ranunculus because of those beautiful shiny yellow petals. This one is very different habitat from the other two. This one is growing 
in marshes. So sometimes out in the open in marshes and sometimes a little bit shady marshes. So maybe this is stepping a little bit outside of the woods, but a beautiful flower that's been in bloom now for several weeks. Have a little quiz here. Let's see what we're gonna have this time. Uh, it looks yellow and what we've been looking at lately is probably a buttercup. Which of the buttercups do you think that is? Look at the leaf. There's a leaf there. A little hard to see this background. There's another leaf right there. This one's the early buttercup. And in the, in the buttercup family, uh, for reasons I'm not, I can't really tell you why, I, I've, I've always, this has been one of my favorites for a while for a very long time. The leaves are very delicate. Um, the, it's sort of incised on the on the edges, wedge shape at the base. Uh, the flower looks, you know, in, in if you look it up close, it looks much like the ranunculus. It looks much like the Calpha pilaris, the marsh marigold, many many stamens, uh, and then a, a many carpels. In this case, again, maturing into many separate achenes. That's the wooden egg, a very common wildflower, widely distributed in our woods in the springtime. And another one that blooms just a little bit in advance of the wooden, wood anemone, the sharp lobe tapatica, is uh, again has lost its petals and, and the sepals, function is petals five to eight of these petaloid sepals. But the way you recognize sharp lobe tapatica more than the flower, I mean, it's a beautiful flower. And when it flowers in the woods, it's generally one of the first, along with bloodwood, which we'll do here in just a minute. Uh, it's that beautiful three-lobe leaf here coming to a point. There is, uh, there are, there are a hepaticas that are round-lobed hepaticas. We don't. This is by far the most common in our area. Here is that mottled surface to the leaf, much like we saw with trout lilies and uh, and the red trillium, red or prairie trillium. Close up of the flower, again, looking very much like our other buttercup family flowers here with maybe a few more of these petaloid uh, sepals. Early meadowroo is the last, uh, I think the last, or maybe not the last of our um, um, uh, buttercup family plants today. This one really doesn't, this is a strange, a strange uh, plant here. This has divided the leaf and many leaflets, delicate leaflets on very thin petioles, a little uh, uh, very, very small, sharp uh, sinuses in, in the tips of the leaflets. And this one, a wind-pollinated plant. So all flowering plants evolved in, in combination with developing insect pollination, and yet some of them reverted back to wind pollination. And this is one of them, they, this is dioecious, meaning there are separate male and female plants. The male plants, which often seem more abundant in the woods to me, have these uh, stamens dangling down, releasing lots of pollen in the wind. And the female plants um, um, yeah, or, or have the long uh, styles and stigmas to gather pollen on the wind. Uh, very delicate, beautiful plant. Nice garden plant if you want to plant this in your garden, a very different, very delicate texture in the garden. This has a, a, a slightly taller, coarser relative. The, there are two of them, meadow roos, that grow out in the meadows. This is the early meadow roo um, is, is, a, is a denizen of the woods. And here, what do we have here? Huh. What does that look like, that delicate? a compound, sort of five lobe compound lethal incisions on the end line. My gosh, it's my favorite wildflower, the, the woodland wood anemone. Hey, Tom, you may have to stop share and reshare checking those boxes. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Let's go back. Um, you know, this is the, so I have to start the screen share again. I have to click the boxes. 
Thanks everybody for bearing with us with some of the tech <laughs> issues today. Excuse me. That's all right, dear. You can't help it. Bad news. When does that all offend today, guys? Oof. Did you get a whiff of that? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Yeah, well, Shakespeare would gag on that rose. Beware the blooming skunk. Beware, beware. Lest the spirits of spring we dare. Yeah, it's uh, not so much the spirits I'm worried about. It's the smell. Uh, excuse me again. Could you try a little harder, dear? In the vernal wetland dwell the spirit that doth reek and smell. You can say that again. In the vernal wetland dwell the spirit that doth reek and smell. Stop, okay? The smell is bad enough. Dear. Not again. Excuse me. So we got a little intermission here. We'll be back at uh, back with you at eleven o'clock. Whoa, there's a lot of faces on that screen. <laughs> yeah, we got a big group today. I think we had seventy-two at our height. We're about 66 right now. Okay. If anybody didn't hear that, I think the intermission noise uh, for the clapping may have been at the same time, but you can take a break for 10 minutes. We'll be back at 11 o'clock. I did have one question that popped up that I missed earlier, but uh, okay. for the Allium canadens, the bulblets, yeah. is that what we eat, like garlic cloves? Uh, no, no, those are underground, the underground bulbs. There, there, there's the onion bulb is below ground. It's if you look at a garlic clove, there is an end where the roots are coming out. So that's, uh, yeah, it is kind of confusing. It confused me for a long time. You have to look to look these things up it's not intuitively obvious when you look at the plant what those funny funny bulb like structures are and they look kind of like a garlic clove don't they we had a comment that somebody had uvularia blooming now in their garden such a beautiful flower yeah it is yeah it's a i don't i don't i don't, I don't usually see it in the woods a lot when i see it it's always worth stopping it Taking in, taking in the dew for a while. Well, the person said they have several green dragon after getting one from a plant rescue. They're really cool plants. Yeah, I love the. Uh, yeah, I love the sim. There's something exotic about the symmetry of leaves. Hard to know why certain shapes appeal, but that that shape of the leaf uh, is so unlike other plants. See, there was Looks a, like we had an image in the chat. Yeah, I'll uh, share my screen now. I just got that. We had somebody ask what this plant is. That's a purple dead. Uh, I'd have to. Um, I, 
I'm not sure I can come up with a lot on that one, just, uh, just off the top of my head. Uh, it's easy to see that even the leaves take on a purplish cast. I think it was, it used to, so you grow in cemeteries a lot, so uh, volunteer in cemeteries. So I'll have, to, I'll have to look up the Latin on that one. It's purple in that all. Does uh, Lemium purpureum sound right? Yeah, it sounds about right, yeah. It said the bumblebees seem to like it. Well, even even weeds, uh, you know, can serve a purpose. Uh, you see that? See the bilaterally symmetric uh, mint flower there. The 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 lobes of the lobes of the leaf there. Um, here, the upper upper part is formed into a hood. Quite a fuzzy leaf. And then the yeah. cat squares yeah. too. Yeah, I, I actually, I there was a there's a mint that I stuck in the last the second half where I was going to go through the mint family. The square stem and opposite leaves. <laughs> That's about a 98% clue you're looking at a mint. There are always exceptions, and there are other plants not in the family that have square stem and op opposite leaves. But it's a, it's a really good place to start if you see that, uh, to start thinking mint. Only a few mints have a mint, have what we think of as a minty odor. Most of those, well, in general, like mentha and pycnanthemum being very common when most of the mint genera don't have what we think of as a minty odor. Now, it might be similar to insects that are eating the leaf, but um, so it doesn't have to smell like a mint to be a mint. You're really looking, square stem opposite leaves, and then if you've got any flowers, you're looking for that uh, bilateral symmetric flower. We'll, we'll go through that a little bit more in the second half today. There was another question in the chat. I believe we put this in the later part of the presentation, so feel free to say, Hold on until a little bit later, but can you okay. recommend a book or books that feature wildflowers represented in McHenry County in Illinois? Well, I mean, there. I'll tell you what I started with. I started with Peter Stein, Two Wildflowers, I think it's in the Northeastern United States. But, um, and I still think it's a, it's a lovely book to start with. Uh, if you keep at it, one day you may outgrow it. Uh, and it doesn't have, particularly when you get out in prairies and savannas, maybe Newcomb's Guide is a little bit better uh, for have, having a few of the species. Even those little handbooks, you can't have all the species, but you can have most of the common ones. And so those two are, are really nice, the tall grass, well, you gotta, I mean, there are, there are a variety of um, books that are more local. I mean, I, I can tell you what, what I started with and, uh, I, I haven't, my my original copy of Peterson's Wildflower Guide, which I, I don't use it much anymore, but I treasure it, it's on the shelf. When I open it up, I see all these links on the pages and, you know, all these things written in there to help my memory to remember the things that that aren't pointed out on the, in the book itself. Uh, yeah, it's a, so I think, yeah, the, the Audubon Guide to, you know, to wildflowers, I can't remember. I think it's the Eastern United States or Northeastern United States is a, this is a nice book. I don't, from, for myself, I don't find pictures as useful as diagrams, uh, but uh, you know, try a few of those and see which one works best for you. There is one, a prairie plants in Illinois put out by, what was originally put out, called the Conservation in Illinois, then now the Department of Natural Resources. Um, but that one really doesn't have many of the woodland wildflowers. You know, we can we can do some sharing on that at the end because there are lots of resources now many online resources i mean i use a lot of online stuff now because i'm um i'm not a triple distilled botanist i was trained as an ecologist i've done a lot of work with plants over the years but i certainly have questions all the time about unusual unknowns when i'm doing a survey 
And what I do is take it through the keys and then I start looking online for a variety of pictures to see which, if, if, if I've gotten, you know, did a couplet wrong early on in the key and you got off in the wrong family or something. Yeah, yeah. so that's lots of resources these days. Yeah, that's a great one for, for local uh, wildflowers, Kane County, um, and, and still available. Some of the terminology in these books the Latin terminology is getting a little bit old. Uh, old in the sense that when you look online or you look in the floor of the Chicago region today, you will find the same plant put into a different genus and sometimes the genus put into a different family. That's just, uh, um, uh, botany is a, is, a, is a developing science and we're constantly reassessing the evolutionary relationships of plants and when you do that, you have to switch their classifications. Frustration for people that just want a, a name they can hang on a plant, but the name has more implications than just the name. It's really you know, about evolutionary relationships of plants. And so they change from time to time, particularly uh, nowadays with molecular biology, we've reassessed evolutionary relationships in a lot of different plant groups. And so if you look through the floor of the Chicago region, uh, you'll find a lot of your favorite plants have moved around. Uh, just a fact of an active science and a better and better understanding of the world. Go. You know? I had one other comment that uh, okay. they walked the coral woods yesterday. Not many plants in bloom. Is it too wet? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, the warmer the world gets, the uh, the the colder and wetter springs get in McKenna County. It seems uh, we've had some really pretty days, but punctuated by a lot of long, cold, wet weather. So things have been developing slowly. I, I was in, I last to Coral Woods probably about a week ago, uh, and there were you know blood roots, blood roots, and uh, hepaticas just starting in the bloom. But um, um, yeah, not a lot in in full bloom. Well, another there's, one that somebody a, recommended. There's another one. But it is about 11 o'clock, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so okay. we can get back to the presentation. Thank you, everybody, for your suggestions. Okay. Saw somebody had that uh, May Watts book with them. <laughs> hmm. Why did it go back to the beginning, I wonder? So um, is everything clear? Are the pictures clear? Do we have um, any? Yes. Okay, all right. So we're going to start off. Shooting star is a plant uh, that is a prairie plant, but it also grows in oak savannas. We, we, a lot of our it's, oak um, savanna I think we wild. have a few people for which it's not clear. Um, so maybe try that, okay. resharing the screen me, without checking the boxes. Uh, Thank I mean, you for uh, I, bearing with us with the tech I, issues again, guys. We, we've discovered that okay. sometimes when we share it, when we check the optimize button, the videos are good, but the regular slides are a little fuzzy. So trying to balance the two. Okay. That looks clearer. Okay. So shooting stars were really a, a common oak savanna plant in the past. They were mostly pushed out of the woods just as the woods filled in uh, with both native uh, trees, sugar maples and elms and ashes and everything else growing in there and a lot of shade, but also buckthorn and honeysuckle. Uh, what's often left behind though of the shooting star, even woods that have reclosed in, are these. And if you're going to recognize those big broad leaves with that red vein toward the base, you'll see those actually survive in a lot of woods that at least a lot of the other savanna ground flora has disappeared. And if you clear that wood and let the sunlight in, the plant will flower again. It doesn't tend to flower when it's in really heavy shade. The other enemy of, of shooting stars is deer. The, the plant just, just, just eat it off, which prevents the plant from multiplying. 
pretty distinctive wildflower in this case. The rosette of red vein leaves and this bunch of flowers that well look maybe a little bit like shooting stars. The stamens and pistil are sort of fused together there in the center to a point. Petals are then reflexed and pointing upward. A very, very distinctive flower. Not easy to confuse this one with our other spring wildflowers. I had a comment in the in chat that apparently they have a mild grape-like fragrance. Ah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Well, this year I'll have to make sure to kneel down. I have a pollen allergy, so I don't sniff flowers a lot. Um, um, but I'll have to try that one. It matures into a capsule. You can do these capsules and little seeds come out. The top. Uh, there are a lot of bed straws in our floor. I'm only going to do a couple of them. This is a, to me, a, a pretty one of the woods. Shining bed straw. You can kind of see the leaves are slick and shiny on the upper surface. Bed straws have their leaves in whorls at a node. And if you did the woody plant workshop, you know the node is a position on a stem where a leaf attaches. In this case, at every node, there are many leaves. This is six leaves per node. The flowers in many bed straws, not all of them, but most of them are four petal. It looks like we've got one errant five petal flower there, but most of them are four petal flowers. There are some bed straw three petals, unusual for a dicot. And these uh, flowers will mature. Um, there's a close up of the four petal flower, four, four sepals, four petals, four stamens and they mature into a little uh, little nutlet. With some of the bed straws, they not have little hairs on them that stick stick the, the nutlet to your trousers as you walk past. Some of them are smooth like this one. This one is very common and for that reason, not highly regarded by many wildflower aficionados. Uh, I, I always thought this plant has a sense of humor. Uh, it, uh, it's all parts of the plant are covered in these in these sharp little um, hook-like hairs and will grab onto you as you walk past. They sort of sprawl in big masses on the ground and whole parts of the plant will grab onto your trousers and you'll drag them along with you. It's always fun in the woods to take off a little part of this plant and throw it at your friend and watch it stick to them and stick it on their back. They don't know it's there. It's a little 12 year old and all of us, you know, you gotta- You'd never do that, would there. you? <laughs> uh, I've done that many times. Uh, um, and a four petal flower here, uh, typical of most of the gallings. I mean, this, uh, this is a method of dispersal for the plant. In this case, you're not just dragging the seed, you're dragging whole bunches of the plant around with you or with any mammal that walks by and catches this stuff on, on their fur, drags and feeds along with them. Uh, sometimes called Velcro plant. I don't like those modern common names. It's traditionally called Cleus. Uh, this is a non-native bed straw becoming increasingly common in our area. It will grow in the woods. It often grows weedy along sidewalks and, and, uh, and uh, trails. Uh, I have seen it invading prairie restorations. Probably got mixed in with, with some of the like Norbit straw that was in the prairie seed mix. Here you've got more than six leaves at a node. The leaves are wider than most of the other bed straws, so not hard to recognize if you look for it. But uh, I've walked through prairie restorations where there's northern bed straw, which is really a beautiful uh, native bed straw, and then this growing in the same one, and at first glance you confuse one with the other. So this, this is a sort of native bed straw look-alike. You need to keep your eyes out for this one. And for four sepals, four petals, and uh, more than six leaves per node. So in that sense, pretty easy to recognize. Wild geraniums come out, they're sort of the second wave of spring wildflowers. They're not the blood roots and hepaticas of the spring floor. They come out a little bit and then last into June. Beautiful five, five sepals and five petals, 10 stamens. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the uh, there are many geranium relatives used in gardening and they're called cranes bills and it's not um doesn't take much of an imagination to understand why they're called 
cranes of those, those the, the ovary matures in this long structure and then it kind of breaks apart in a rather bizarre fashion. Um, the leaves uh, are easily visible now in the woods, these deeply palmately low, palmate means like your hand, all the lobes and sinuses go back to a central point, deeply palmately lobe leaves, the surface has these impressed veins, you call that a rugose surface. Combination of those two features makes the leaves easy to recognize that are, that are out well, well ahead of the flowers. Um, beautiful kind of our woodlands. Sometimes a little bit wider in color and not quite as blue. White Avens is one of those tough guys of the woods that survives a lot of abuse. It is a native woodland wildflower. It does flower in the springtime, but it also will invade a uh, beat up uh, you know, shady places. Uh, you find it growing in shady places in your yard sometimes. You didn't plant it there. It just finds its way there. Uh, the Akeens, you know, the flower in some ways mimics some of our uh, buttercup five sepal five petal. In this case, only 10 stamens, but many carpels that are, that are mature into many Akeens. And each of the Akeens has a little hook on the end that can grab onto you when you walk past and is carried around one of those hitchhiker fruits. Uh, but the, probably the most addictive thing about white avens are these basal leaves that are evergreen. These leaves were under the snow during the winter. Um, and they're easily visible at this time of year in the springtime, that deep blue-green color in the white veins. And out of this will grow, this is the young stem growing out of it. And it has these you know, just sort of plain Jane green leaves along this along this stem that look very different from the base of leaves. You might think it was a different plant, but it's the same plant and then it develops these flowers. So one of one of the one of the tough guy survivors of our native woodland flora that hangs around long after most of the uh, oak savanna flora has disappeared from shading. There's a close relative of it that really isn't a isn't a isn't a woodland plant, but I just snuck it in because it's so pretty often used in, in the uh, garden trade now. You would say, well, it looks nothing like uh, white avens, but look again, there are five white petals in there, five sepals, but your eyes are distracted by these long plumo styles of each of those separate uh, carpels there. Um, so hence the name prairie smoke sort of looked like uh, smoke. There are the five sepals. Of the of the flower, so a close relative of the white avens, the leaf reminiscent of the avens leaf since it's pinnately compound, but maybe at first glance it looks very different to you. The overall flower structures are exactly the same, just some of the parts have been modified from that more standard looking white avens flower. Here is our mint, uh, and it will kind of. <laughs> One that you might have fought with in your front yard, it grows all over the place. You find it in the woods, edges of woods uh, in your yard, growing all over the place. This is King Charlie, sometimes given other, other common names, Glycoma heresia. Uh, little, uh, you might say kidney-shaped little leaf. If you look closely, you'll find the square stem and opposite leaves. But there's the, the flower. No mint flowers have two. They're bilaterally symmetric, as I said before. They have they originate, evolutionarily speaking, as a five-petal flower. Two petals fuse into the upper lip. Three petals fuse into the lower lip, and so you have a two-lip flower. The the original uh, name for the family, uh, not Lamiaceae, it was Labiate or Labium lip. There were two lips to the flower, and that's. True of all of them, it's one of the, some of them lose that upper lip, but for the most part, they all have two lips, four stamens, uh, and then a four carpellate over it that matures into a capsule. Hey, Tom, we had a question about Creeping okay. Charlie. Is there okay. a Creeping Charlie with purple colored leaves? I don't think so. I think you're probably looking at the, the, the purple dead nettle. Creeping Charlie's is prostrate. It just grows right on the ground. And I can't say that it never happens. I'd have to go out and start looking at the Creeping Charlie in my yard to see if some of those leaves look a little bit purplish. Um, 
purple dead nettle, which has a, has a more upright growth form, is a mint that has a much more purpley color to the upper leaves in Creeping Charlie. But look, look closely and look for this, this flower shape. It's a very different flower shape from purple dead nettle, which had a hood, but a big convex hood on top. This one uh, has a real, much more delicate two-lobed upper lip. Mint is a large family, so there are actually many mints out there. We're only gonna, most of them are summer flowering. So we'll, if we do a summer, you know, a prairie plant uh, version of this, prairie savanna plant version of this in summer, we'll have a lot of mints and we'll talk much more about the mint family. Whoops, come on. Come on, let's go, there we go. Uh, one sedge, not fair, uh, there are lots of it. Sedge, the genus Carex is the biggest genus of our flora. We'll certainly, if we do one about in, in more in the summertime, we'll, we'll talk a lot about woodland sedges at least. And if we, talk, if we do a wetland one, we'll talk a lot about wetland sedges. I just wanted to slip this one in. It's actually rather pretty in the springtime when it goes into flower. You can see the flower, flower cluster has this reddish brown color. Here are the males on top with those yellow anthers coming out of the stamens and the female flowers are the white styles and stigmas of the ovaries. And when that matures, here are the cluster of fruits uh, below the what was formerly the cluster of male flowers. Uh, this is called a spikelet, or we, today we just call it a spike, spike like a rain. Uh, and the characteristic fruit of the uh, of the of Carex <coughs> is the perigenia, uh, which is an unusual fruit. The actual matured ovary, the fruit is is a is a is inside of it. It's a little nutlet or an akene. It's then surrounded by this sac, which is an accessory part, presumably a bract, that then that then completely encompassed the ovary. Um, through which the style coming out of the ovary has to protrude out the end. And the perigenia is subtended by another bract uh, in the spikes. That's, that's, the, that's the sort of characteristic structure. We'll talk more about in, that in, as we do summer and wetland um, uh, workshops where we have a lot more sedges to work with. That's a characteristic structure of the sedges. Pen sedge is probably the common of our woodland sedges. Probably, I say, originally, I, I, m much of the dry open savanna would have had one of the basic uh, parts of the ground floor would have been mats of the sedge. Um, it was probably one of the very important fuel plants. It carries fire, fires through our early savannas and barrens in the Chicago region. So ecologically, very, very important plant. Still, it's still around in our remnant woodlands, probably much less abundant than it used to be. Uh, and the other thing about sedges are the three rank leaves. Now this is not Carex pensylvanica. This is another, this is Delichium, uh, a, even a different genus in the sedge family, but I put it in because the leaves are short and stout and they're very closely spaced along the stem and the three ranking is just unstakeable. This isn't some fancy horticultural selection. This is the way Delichium looks in nature and it's three ranks. So all the sedges have three rank leaves and you can actually see that if you look closely on all the sedges. It tends to leave the stem of the sedge triangular sometimes, often, but not always. So three rank leaves are characteristic of the sedges. Oops, looks like we've got a quiz coming up. Ah, what would this be? What would this be? Yeah. Deep blue-green color, white veins, pinnately arranged lobing of, of, of leaf. You guessed it, white avens. Um, again, one of the tough guy survivors of our native native plants. Cal parsnip will surprise you if you walk say in coral woods in the southwest part of McHenry County. It has beautiful array of wildflowers. You come up on cow parsnip and you think this must be sort of weird alien invader. And I mean alien like on a spaceship because most of the spring wildflowers are so small and delicate and cow parsnip is so big and coarse. These big hairy leaves unfolding and you think something must pull out. But oh, this is a native plant. 
um, and it's a member of the carrot family or the APACE, or instead of the conserved old name of the family was umbellifery, uh, relating to the umbel-like arrangement of the flowers. Now remember what an umbel is, the flower where all the individual flowers are on a stalk, and the stalk, the stalks of that, of that flower cluster are then joined at a sim single point. Well, this is an individual umbel here, and then the umbels are joined are on another stalk that's joined at a single point. So this is a compound umbel. Most of our umbel for umbelifery or ABACE plants in the Chicago area have a compound umbel. But um, the, the umbel-like arrangement, again, is a conserved arrangement of the family. In fact, I think this was one of the very first plant families recognized by early botanists whose family still holds together today because of that umbel-like arrangement. The actual individual flowers are quite small. They have five sepals and five petals. Oh, and the other, the other um, feature of the umbellifery that we really can't forget here are these uh, sheathing of the leaf. There, here is the leaf. I mean, the sheath is almost bigger than the leaf. And the leaf doesn't join here. The leaf then becomes the sheath, and the leaf is actually joining down here. And you can see the same thing happening over here where we have a larger leaf and there's the sheet wraps around the stem. The leaf actually attaches there. This leaf attaches down here at the base of the sheath. Here's another leaf, another sheath, and the leaf attaches here. Now it's not always that exaggerated, but uh, if you, next time you eat a piece of celery, you'll notice how it gets very wide at the base. It's a, it comes from a member of the, of the umbellifery, uh, and that's the sheathing base to the leaf. And in all of the umbellifery will have a sheathing base to some extent. And this is another one of those characteristics that, about, that gets you about 95% of the way there. There are a few plants and other families with a sheathing leaf base, but use, use help whenever you can get it. And so it's a nice vegetative character, a clue, to help you when you're in your in your um, puzzling over what you're looking at. Uh, here's another member of the up umbellifery, a golden Alexander, which is a sort of savanna to prairie plant, very common, often is easily reestablished in our in our savannas and prairies. Um, if we, uh, they're they're that nice compound umbel again, here you can see the individual flower, the stalk joining together, and then that's on a stalk going together at a central point, the compound umbel. Uh, and then we have the leaves that are, that are compound. And look at the pointed, they have long pointed leaflets. And this summer, I, at last minute, I took the, uh, the wild parsnip out of the presentation to try to keep the number of plants down. It's the lookalike, the alien lookalike that grows in meadows that is phototoxic, uh, that you don't want to get on your skin. So make sure before you, when you rush up to the thing like Golden Alexander, make sure you look in your book to see what the uh, um, wild parsnip looked like first, or you end up with some blisters. Um, ah, there is, there is the sheathing base, not as obvious on the Golden Alexander, but still, still there. Um, Curious the number of our spring wildflowers that have this modeling of the color of the upper surface of the leaf. I don't have an explanation for that. If anyone has heard one, they could volunteer it in the chat box or at the end of the presentation. Other than it looks pretty, uh, it's a nice identification character, sort of water spotting on the leaflets, a sort of compound leaf. Each of the leaflets deeply uh, lineate. Um, the flowers are 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 pretty the, the leaf is there so much more than the flowers and so easy and I, I used to recognize it first by the leaf and then by the flowers when the petals are fused together we call it the corolla so we have five petals that are fused into a five lobed corolla when sepals are fused together we call it a calyx here we have five sepals fu fused together into a five lobed calyx and the ovary matures into a two carpellate capsule. There's the capsules. Kind of hairy. Jacob's ladder. 
I think I may be partial to blue wildflowers. Every time one comes up, I say, this is one of my favorites. Uh, but like the uh, water leaf, I usually recognize it by its leaves. Uh, Jacob was uh, way, way back in the Bible, um, Hebrew Bible. He's uh, running away from his brother Esau, and he comes a dream. He comes across a ladder to heaven. And uh, look at those, look at the rungs of the ladder there. They're so beautifully, evenly arranged. Uh, it's a yeah, nice name for this plant. I like that name. Uh, the ladder-like foliage really stands out to me. I mean, the flower is, is pretty like most of the spring wildflowers, but it's the, it's the leaves that really stand out to me as distinctive for this plant. Looks like we've got another quiz here. Jackie actually did this, so if you want to complain about the video, you complain to her. Um, Thanks. <laughs> um, credit where credit is due. Uh, Notice how the leaves are, are pointing here. You guessed it. This is our golden Alexander. So usually around the edges of woods in very open savanna situations. Whoops. Um, this must have been one of the first wildflowers I learned, blue flowers. More, in my, my experience, more abundant in DuPage County where I was living when I was learning my wildflowers. Um, First, there at the College of DuPage. Uh, five, now, now remember I said the, uh, the Dames rocket did a sort of flox imitation, but how many petals did the Dames rocket have? It was a member of the mustard family, it had four petals, and all the flox have five. And there's more, and if we look at more closely at the flox flower, here are what looks like the petals, but that, that, then those are petals, but the petals are all fused into a long tube that just branches into these five lobes at the end. So the petals are all fused together into a long tube that's then uh, lobed only at the end of the petals. Again, the calyx is fused into a five lobe, or the sepals are fused into a five lobe calyx and you can see great masses of these in the woods uh, again i see more me my experience on that, a bit south of McHenry county but still common in McHenry county this is what i look for early in the season before it's in flower are these uh um well peach, peach leaf sort of sort of leaves uh and then joined opposite one another without any stalk sessile on the stalk and uh and slightly hairy uh Pretty easy to recognize before the flowers come out. And this, again, is a little bit sort of the way wildflower, a little bit after your blood roots and the hepaticas in the springtime. Uh, May apples. Um, well, I know I say a lot of these are my favorites, but they are, so I'll just say it. May, May apples uh, are particularly the leaves. They've always reminded me of a bunch of old men with umbrellas, sort of grumpy old men in the woods with umbrellas. Uh, that's what I think of every time I see a colony of May apples. Uh, they first punch out of the ground. They look sort of like green mist punching through, and here this one is just starting to unfold. And once they unfold, they'll have flowers. It, it, often you don't see the flowers if you walk past quickly. They're, they're, they're under the leaves, so you have to kind of crouch down and pull the leaf up with your with your fingers so you can see under that to see see the flowers very very beautiful flower that then matures into these um apple well, they're sort of like i guess they're a berry or a big green fleshy capsule i'm not sure quite what to call them they're sort of technically listed as poisonous at least until ripe uh, um would lead me to believe that if they're slightly poisonous, it's probably only mildly so. My father, who uh, in childhood was in the Great Depression in uh, Northern Kentucky living with his grandmother, she said his grandmother would make a sort of juice out of the mature May apple uh, fruits. I've never done that. I've tasted it. it. I wouldn't say it really knocks my socks off in flavor, but I've never had that would have been my uh, great grandmother's uh I, she died long before i was born so i never got to taste her may apple juice so what is 
this one. Well, if you were trying to get to heaven and you saw this, maybe you could use that as a ladder. So that's, whoops, did that, said I wasn't going to do that, Jacob's ladder. Now to blood root, which uh, is, uh, I think a lot of people favorite it. One of the first, and that hepatic root sort of competing with one another to be the first wildflower in the woods each year. Um, the sepals are only two, they're deciduous. By the time you see the flower, they've fallen off. Petals can be sort of not, not a set number, eight to 12. Lots of stamen, ovary, two fused into a capsule, beautiful flower when it unfolds these leaves, um, will eventually uh, flatten out this arrangement. Initially, they're sort of cupped around the flowering stem as it comes up. Uh, uh, there are irregular number of these sinuses, uh, sometimes only a couple of obvious ones at the tip, sometimes many more. A uh, very distinctive leaf, very distinctive uh, you know, growth point that comes out of the ground. Not a hard one to recognize. One of the first, one of our first wildflowers out in the woods uh, in the springtime. We have, uh, I had to stick this one in. It sort of goes from meadows into savannas. Where I see it in Glacial Park, it's actually growing in a, in a what was a very, very dry open savanna formerly brought dry open savanna situation. I needed to put this because I wanted to have at least one member of the composite family, uh, or the Asteraceae, um, of these beautiful, this beautiful daisy-like seed heads. And I know all of us, when we first started looking at wildflowers, called this a flower, but it's not a flower. It's a head of flowers. That's a flower. 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 And this is a head of probably several dozen flowers uh, and we'll get to that structure in just a minute when we look at senecio we see the bottom leaves i'm sorry it's now in the genus macaram go back to the older older genus uh, it was put in in the fourth edition of plants of chicago region the basal leaves have this simple elliptical shape the leaves along the stem, you could call those colline leaves, have this pinnate, again, pinnate is like a feather, pinnate cut, making them really quite different from the, uh, from the basal leaves. That contrast is true of a number of the plants in a pack or a genus. But let's look at composite head. We'll come back to this when we do summer plants in another workshop in the future, but it's one of my favorites. I love the conserved arrangements in flowers, how evolution does this. So in any composite head, you have these bracts around the edges that form the involucre. It's called the involucre. And those are the involucral bracts, or sometimes called pillories. We have these ray flowers, these long asymmetrical ray flowers, often along the edges of the head, in the daisy head like like we had in, in uh, in uh, balsam ragwort, we had ray flowers around the edges. In the center are these smaller disc flowers that have radially symmetric uh, corolla tubes like this one. So we have a long, this is the ray flower, this is the disc flower. Um, okay, we've got a tiny little quiz here. This is the ovary, the female part. Uh, we'll start on the other side. So, so here's the, the stigma of, the, of the, the style comes up and branches out. So that's the female part. As we go out, we get to the male part that has to be the stamens. In fact, the anthers are all fused together into a tube. All right, the next step out from the center of a flower has to be the petals. So that's the corolla tube. One step further out is here, and what does that have to be? has to be the sepals. But it doesn't look like sepals, does it? They look like hairs. But the hairs are pappus. Uh, we have on many composites, um, I seem to lose my point, so there it is. The pappus are the modified sepals of the flower. And we can see them here, they're plumas. Uh, here they're pushed out on a long beak. 
but those are the modified sepals of the, of the individual composite flower, like this one, like that lovely plant, wildflower of your front yard. The dandelion here, they're all ray flowers, no disc flowers, they're all the strap-like ray flowers. Leaves. I found these in old growth hemlock northern hardwood forests in the upper Palenza of Michigan, miles and miles away from the nearest house. So that agent of dispersal is pretty darn efficient. Um, actual, I know you're telling me dandelions can't possibly be pretty, but this one that a beautiful structure. If you look at it under a microscope, it's just the, the, the form, the, the structure of that is just amazing. Even the architecture of the outside of the individual, it's just an amazingly beautiful structure. As I pull hundreds of these out of my yard every year, but still, beauty in nature, even when it hurts. Okay, what does that look like here? We have leaves that are kind of folded around. We have, looks like the flower is sort of pushing up these leaves folded around them. And that is the blood root. I'm sure most of you got that one. Horse gentian uh, are, are, I would say fairly common if the woods, uh, it, it's, they tended to survive grazing better than a lot of other of our, of our wildflowers, so they're often scattered around as remnant in woods, even those woods that, that got grazed pretty hard. And there are two of them that are so much alike, I just put them on the same slide. For foliatum, which is what this one is, here the leaf, the two leaves are fused together and the stem just punches through the middle of it. We call that a perfoliate arrangement. Um, and it's in the butter, oh, I missed, I shouldn't, this is the honeysuckle family. That's a mistake. I probably copied and pasted and didn't see that. This is the honeysuckle family, Caprifoliaceae. And in that family, you tend to have two flowers in pairs in the axils of leaves. The axil of the leaf is where the leaf joins the stem. There's our pair of flowers. Um, in this case, it looks like you've only have one on each side, but there's, here's Arantiacum, the other horse gentian. Um, Otherwise, very, very similar. They're, they're sort of more attractive when they're in fruit. They have these beautiful orange fruits, again, usually pears in the axils of leaves. That's Orantiacum there. Um, so it's a, it's a flower that's not super common. You should run it if you're out with very much walking around, you'll see some horse gentians. For my money, it's a little bit more of the sort of oak savanna plant than it is other sort of more shady, uh, sort of red oak, sugar maple, uh, basswood sort of woods. And uh, here we have the, the violets. This is the last two, then we'll have some question and answer here. Um, violets are another bilaterally symmetric group. There's, there's the plane of symmetry, a little fuzz on the inside of those. Fairly easy to recognize. We're just gonna do two. Uh, and they're easy to tell apart one thing, the next one will have a different color of flower. Notice how the stems of the blue violet and the leaves all go down and join at a common point at the base of the plant called a cespitose arrangement. Uh, this one is probably growing in your yard. I have them in my yard. Uh, pretty hardy. This is actually our state flower. Where the yellow violet is, you can see the stem coming up, branching leaf leaves out on the stem. Uh, and flowering from upper parts of the stem. Uh, and there's that characteristic violet flower again, five petals, five sepals, and a three carpellate ovary that matures into uh, a, uh, a capsule. If you look, and there we go. I just put that slide in to show the stem derangement. Pretty obvious when you're out in the woods and you see either one of these. One of the things I wanted to say, last thing I wanna say is with blue violets, and I'm not sure about the stem violets, but you'll often find that they make, they have closed flowers. After, after the, these colorful flowers are done, if you watch them closely, they'll set up what looks like a flower, but it never opens. And that flower will self-pollinate and create seeds, uh, obviously self-pollinate seeds um, 
inside of those closed flower called Cleistogamous flower. Just an unusual thing about some of the violets that we don't see. And with that, we're done. So we're back to uh, questions now, and I will stop share. So we can, you can share screens or show pictures or just ask questions uh, about what you've just seen. Great. No, I am going to ask blaze. a couple of the questions from the chat before we get to the sh sharing part. Uh, but just so you know, if you do have a picture or anything that you want to ask about, have that open on your desktop or open that up now um, while we go through these other questions. And then if you want to be someone that shares your screen and ask questions to raise your hand, uh, when you go to the bottom of your screen, that taskbar, uh, there's that participants button. And then on the bottom right side, you should see a button that says raise your hand. So you'll pop up on my screen in the order in which the questions are. So then I'll tell you, hey, it's your turn to share the screen. Um, and I'll explain how to do that. Um, so we had kind of a side discussion going on in the chat about uh, Golden Alexander being kind of aggressive. So uh, just wanted to know your comment on that. Was it overseeded in early grassland restoration? Um, can it be aggressive? Expand on that. Well, I've certainly seen it growing in large masses. I, I'm, I don't, I guess I, I don't, I don't see it in, in, I don't feel tempted to go control it. Let's say if you have a very small prairie in a yard, then obviously, and you're asking, you know, two dozen plants to share a small space, you have to discipline some of those plants more than you would in a very large prairie where a big patch of golden Alexander is just an attractive patch of golden Alexander and you don't really worry about it. Uh, but it, it is one of those hardy plants and it, and it does form fairly large patches. So I can imagine that in a very small prairie, you might want to control it uh, if, if you're looking for more diversity. I had a comment uh, in Champaign County, woodland flax seems to be much more common than up in McHenry. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, had someone yeah, that, I, oh, go ahead. No, I, I just said it was much more common in, in DuPage County. It's one of the fun things about learning about plants is as you go from one place to another, some plants just disappear for reasons that seem completely mysterious. And, or they go from being very uncommon to common. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a mystery to me. Sometimes it seems to have an explanation, sometimes not. I had a fun nickname for May apples. Someone calls them fairy umbrellas. Fairy umbrellas, that's a good one. That's a good one. My grumpy old man umbrellas, I guess, is maybe that's my attitude. Uh, but maybe I've become a grumpy old man, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we had someone ask, uh, there was an earlier comment about a plant rescue in the chat. So if you could share the plant rescue that you recommended in the chat, um, we can share that with everybody as well. Uh, we had another comment that uh, I used to think the bloodroot liked oak woodlands. They have some that are thriving in the sun. Well, uh, a lot of plants will, I mean, yeah, bright sun doesn't necessarily kill things that grow in the wood. The, uh, I don't know if I mentioned when I went past the, uh, or maybe I did, the smooth Solomon seal will grow waist high out in the open and then as a very delicate little wildflower in the woods, same, same plant. Uh, the, growing out in the sun doesn't mean it would necessarily compete aggressively with other, you know, prairie and Meadow, meadow plants uh, in the long term, but yeah, sun, yeah, plants, many of our native plants suffer more from too much shade than they do from too much sun, that's for sure. We had a comment that dandelions are one of the first flowers native bees seek in the spring. Yeah, yeah, I, I um, that's a nice smell. I, I told uh, Jackie this story. It, the, the dandelion flower is actually um, uh, 
most of the dandelion flowers, even though it has a nice smell and it attracts pollinating insects, is not being pollinated. The seeds are developing from the, the embryo and the seed is developing from a part of the seed coat and is a genetically identical to the parent plant. And so uh, most, most of dandelion's seeds are, are clonal. They are a result of seed ap what's called seed apomixis, which means that dandelion adapts very, very quickly to changes in mowing frequency. If you start mowing a lot, then the flat leaved plants are the ones that that in instantly clone themselves and fill your yard with flat leaf dandelions. And likewise, if you don't mow your yard, the tall leaf dandelions that compete better with tall grass will take over your yard pretty quickly. So it's, it's hard to win on, on that. Um, All right, we've got a couple of people popping up that uh, have pictures to share. So Janet, okay. you're up first. So do you have a picture to share? I can explain how to do that. I believe you're unmuted, so you can talk. All right, so Janet, to share your screen, at the bottom of the taskbar, there is a button that says share screen. And when you click on that, you'll get options of windows that you can click on. So you can click on the photo. You have to have it open already uh, to share what we're looking at here. I think this might be another person sharing their screen. Uh, this is, looks like Christine is sharing her screen. I have to zoom in a little bit closer and know what, what, what I'm looking at here. Huh? It sort of look like a ground cover, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, this, is it this right here? Well, that's it. Christine, can you zoom in a little bit on your plant? Um, do you need it more zoomed in? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I, I. Like we're switching plants. Uh, yeah, Christine, it looks like there's a zoom like... in option at the top left portion of your screen. There's a little sliding bar uh, just to the right of the, the green button and then the arrow and there's a sliding bar. Yeah. So if you want to go back to that photo, you're um, asking for ID. A little bit puzzled. This looks like elderberry to me, or, or red berry to elder. I'm not. I'm not. Um, um, Looks like there's some vinca growing in there. I saw, but as a ground cover, um, I'm not. No, you need to put your go, go to the right. Go, go that way for the this bush. Way. Yeah, that there. Put your thing. That. That. Um, yeah. Christine, I've unmuted you so we can uh, okay. figure out um, which plant you want to point at. It's a bush. Um, it okay. reminds me of um, honeysuckle, but they're small. They stay small. They never bloom. They're on the side of the house, north, north. It looks like coral berry to me. Coral berry. Yeah, well, that's that's. A... Never get anything, and there's ground cover underneath. But you're right. But um, I just a very low mountain. Well, I would certainly say it looks looks. It looks closer related to a honeysuckle. I mean, the, the coral berry is a closely related genus. That's certainly, the, and wh where is this? This is what on part? the north side of the house in McHenry County. Oh, in McHenry County. And the uh, oaks and hickories. Okay, well, I'm. Um, and black cherry. If it's coral berry, it's, it's, it's common in central and north. Often people, plant snowberry around their houses, which is a close relative that is honeysuckle-like. Um, 
it is a it is a flowering plant, so it flowers at some time of year. No. Uh, what well, this one may just get never flowers. Right? Looks like Laurie, our plant ecologist, left a comment that. Uh, okay. Thought it was native yellow honeysuckle. Native yellow. It it might yeah it. Boy, it's hard to it's hard to tell from the picture. That that's one of the things that it might be. Uh, it does have a certainly that the leaves don't look yeah yeah that it could be that. Um, and that yellow. one will persist in shady areas without flowering for a long time. So uh, that that's a, a long time that's, since 1975. That's all. It's still yeah. Well, if you if you if you uh, take it from that place and put it in a sunny place, it should in its uh -huh. native yellow honeysuckle, you should get some really pretty blossoms that will sort of climb up a callus and be really pretty. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you for sharing your screen. Um, we had a question. How do you tell the difference between GM and Ranunculaceae? Um, Let me, let me think. Um, well, the, the overall flower structures are similar. Um, I mean, I'm the Renunc yeah. You're asking me that to the key to families. I'm not sure in the key to families uh, how I would do that. The, the GMs tend to have a pinnately arranged leaf. I don't associate that with a lot of things that, uh, in the in the buttercup family. Um, yeah, the uh, the individual flowers are easy to, for me to tell apart, but a sort of generic way to 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 separate them. I, I have to think about that one for a while. I've never asked myself that question before. Um, we had a question. Can you talk about whether or not Celandine poppy is native to this region? Uh, uh, I want to give that question to Lori because I know there are two poppies. One is native and one is not to the region. Uh, and I always have to look it up. I'm, I'm a bit dyslexic whenever there's two choices. I always get, them, get it wrong. So Lori, are you out there? I am here. I'm looking up the last name. I believe it's not native to McHenry County, but further south. Hold on a second. I got my book here. I also left a an additional comment about that yellow honeysuckle. It'll grow on the understory without flowering for years and years. So that's normally how we see it on our plant surveys. Um, but if Christine, I believe it is, if she does move any out into the open sunlight, after a while it will probably flower and fruit. Um, give, me, give me two minutes on the celandine poppy. Okay. okay, in the meantime, it looks like Paul has shared a picture for us. Oh. Uh, uh, what? Okay. Well, it's a, it's not a native wildflower. My wife, who's a gardener, tells me it's, it's a team, it's a tag team match here. Fritillaria. So with, with an F, Fritillaria is the name. Um, so you could probably look it up from there. Okay, it looks like Lori found it. You're still unmuted, so go ahead and say. Yep, I've got the big floor right in front of me, so there's no um, specimen for uh, Boone County, McHenry, Lake County, Kane County, but there are some reports from DuPage and Cook County and Rich Mesic Woodlands, but I don't consider it native in McHenry County. Never found it naturally. But there is, there is an exotic, well, uh, Call a California poppy that is similar in appearance. This is a yeah. dim memory from my days down at the Arboretum that where, where the two would get confused. Uh, but I'd have to, if someone sends me an email on that, I can clarify it in great detail. But um, 
right off the top of my head, I can't can't uh, tell you exactly the differences between them. Okay, Paula, I've unmuted you. Are you trying to share a new photo or asking about this one? I'm asking about the, the one that's on the screen now. It's, it's in my neighbor's you know, yard this morning. I have no idea what it is. I tried looking it up with the picture type stuff. But yeah. That, that's the fritillaria. No, yeah, F-R-I, F-R-I, T-T-I-L-L-A-R-I-A. Oh, that's interesting. My granddaughter, yeah. was, my granddaughter was over and she, she had downloaded an app from Apple for what is it, uh, you know, plant identification. And I don't remember what it came up on her screen, but that's it. <laughs> so that little app was right. <laughs> is this, is this, common is it native is it just no, no no this is just uh, it's a garden plant uh rather attractive one we have bulb that you plant oh that's what she must have done the neighbor okay well thank you sorry for uh oh it's okay no question is okay. not one i guess um, no worries thanks for sharing um so i know earlier janet had raised your hand you are unmuted so you can go ahead and speak if we accidentally missed your question um, Janet out there, we had a message from her in the chat, uh, High Naturalist website is a great resource to upload images yeah. to help ID flowers, insects, animals, etc. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and mute you again. Thank you for sharing that, Janet. Um, Anne has a raised hand, so you're unmuted. You can go ahead and share your question or share your screen. I know this isn't a flower, it's just a bush, but um, I've never known what it is. It uh, came, I think, from a seed sharing it's really huge and I never know what it is. Is this, uh, does this, you say it, it's big, is it getting bigger? I mean, it looks uh, like. It's, it's tall, it's about, it's taller than I am. So well, well, it's probably I mean, not I mean, it looks like a catalpa tree to me that would continue to get bigger and bigger because they can grow into trees. Um, uh, Okay, uh, unfortunately, I just lost the other pick for it. Um, let me see if I can get it. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's just big. It, 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 I planted some seeds I got from uh, seed sharing and I have no idea what it is. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a woody plant, so there's a there's a twig or a, or a during the winter when the leaves fall off? Yes. It, okay, so I'm pretty sure at the top of it. I mean, there's hardly anything else that looks like that. There's a royal polonia, but I, I, don't, I don't think that's it. The top of it is um, not commonly planted, but you see it, you see it planted around. And uh, it is, an, it is not native to this area is native a little bit south of us um, um well it really loves it i mean it comes back every year and it's oh, yeah. usually so, it didn't find its way here after the glaciers left but when you put it here it seems to be quite happy uh, um i thought no, it always sort of has a, a very, it's very pretty as a shade tree although it does have the long cigar-like fruits that some people don't like to rake off the lawn and the big leaves other than that it's a tree with a lot of character it hasn't yeah. developed those seed pods yet so well, it's, it's obviously pretty young if it's only a little bit taller than you this well in time this will grow into a pretty good sized tree so you might want to ask yourself do you have the space to allow uh, it to do that but Okay. Well, thank um, you for sharing, Anne. No, thank you because I've been reading about this plant for a long time. 
All righty, I'm gonna mute you and go on to our next person. We have B. Wick. You are now unmuted. Um, so you can go ahead and share your okay. screen if you have a picture. Yeah, I'm not sure how to do that, but I've got a picture up on my screen. So if I... At the bottom of your issues. window, there's a taskbar that should pop up and one of the buttons says share screen. So when you click on that, a window should pop up and you can select which thing you would like to share. So select the photo that you would like to show okay. us. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. There we go. Okay, can you can you see it? All there right. We go. We may need you to zoom in a little bit on it. Yeah, it's a little fuzzy. So I'll try that. I know it's a little out of focus. Oh, there. So this is this isn't something that's in flower now, is it? Uh, no, I don't believe so. It's a picture from last year, probably a little later in the summer yeah, yeah. It's, it, well it would appear to be an aster I'm not um I, I'll, I'll, if if this if this is a leaf of the aster i don't i don't know i can't see how it you know it would be some, something like drummond's aster a sort of faintly blue color it's a little hard to be certain looking at a picture like that but uh drummond's aster arrow leafed aster uh there's a big leafed aster i mean if that is a sort of big heart-shaped leaf or is it a you know, I can't look for relative size how far it is in the background. That, it certainly, well, of course, now we, we're using a different genus for aster, but um, it's a common name. You would call it Drummond's aster or arrow leafed aster. That would be my best guess on that one. It's something pretty close to that. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to lower your hand and mute you again. Joe, uh, you're up next, so I have unmuted you. And if you have a picture, you can share your screen. Oops. Oh, sorry, Joe, I think I, I clicked unmute. There we go, try speaking again. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I have a question for you. I've walked the hollows with Debbie Lakowski, last year there was no trilliums. We never saw one. This year I started out last week and I saw one trillium. And it's along the side of the trail and I cover the whole area around it. There are no other trilliums, just this one. How, can you, is that a question? How does it get there? And why just one? Well, you don't think there's any chance that one could you could have missed it last year? I don't think so, because right. Debbie Debbie knows way around the hollows that we never never yeah. saw. Well, trilliums are very long live plants. It, I don't know about you know long range dispersal is always along the trail. You don't know what happens there, but um, my guess is that. Uh, so was that was it was that the first time she has seen it this year? I mean, she's been she has, doing. She hasn't seen it. I mean, I sent her a picture. She hasn't been. Okay, well, well it's a uh, trilliums. Uh, I, I worked with a botanist down in Alabama, or really learned my systematic botany with a botanist down in Alabama many years ago, and uh, he had studied trilliums, and he said the trilliums are are uh, sort of um, immortal. I mean, they don't ever get old. They could just grow for decades and centuries and potentially even longer because there's nothing about them that ever ages like you and I. So they're, they're, but they're not particularly invasive. So the odds that that one zoomed into the area from some far away place seem pretty minimal. My guess is that it was there before uh, and took a year off or, or was covered up by something and inconspicuous. Um, yeah, that would be my best guess, but it's hard to say. I went with to the coral woods with you last year and they were all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I remember right. So. The, red, the, red, the red or prairie trillium is usually often quite common. Yeah, in our so, woods. I mean, this trillium is like what, grizzly <laughs> went off to the hollows to get away from everyone? <laughs> well, 
That's being a little bit anthropomorphic, but maybe <laughs> maybe they're introverted trilliums. I don't know. I don't know. Can you see this? Uh, not probably well enough to. Uh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, when I see it, I'll show you. Show okay. it to you. I just don't know what it is. Okay. Well, that's that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to lower your hand and mute you. Um, and I just want to note it is after 12 o'clock. So if anybody has to jump off, uh, that's technically all the time we plan, but we will stay on as long as there are any questions. So there's a couple in the chat. Um, let's see. We had a question uh, for Paul. You mentioned using an app to identify that plant you shared earlier. Uh, what app was that? I unmuted you, Paul. Yeah, I'd have to. Uh, I'd, I got to look at my phone. My phone's not near me, but I can send you, uh, uh, Jackie. I'll send you the what my granddaughter had sent me. So sure, we're pretty cool. We're pretty nice. It was an right. Apple. It was on Apple apps. So All right, thank you. I'll, I'll include that in the email after the fact. Um, we do send out the PDF of the presentation when we let you guys know that the. Uh, presentation has been posted to YouTube as well. Um, let's see, we had a comment that Trillium are favored deer food. Oh, I think I accidentally muted Tom. There you go. You're unmuted now. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are very much. Uh, particularly, uh, some of the Trilliums suffer a lot from overpopulations of deer. Um, we had a comment that May apples. When I journeyed to the spirit, I saw lots of laughing munchkins. Their gift is to bring joy, laughter, an antidote to grumpy old men. <laughs> Good. Well, they always make me smile when I look at them. Maybe. Uh, uh, and another May apple comment. When I first moved here over 20 years ago, there were a large cluster of May apples under a very old oak. Now there are very few left. I do not use herbicides in the yard, and there has not been a change in the shade. Why could that be? Is there any way to encourage them? That I don't know. Um, this is in your yard. I would, if it, if they're competing with lawn grass, uh, yeah, I, I don't, may apples. I would guess it sounds like a, a competitive thing to me, whatever is displacing the may apples, but without looking at the situation, it would be hard to say. I, I, I would imagine sounds like the soil must be okay there sounds like the amount of light must be okay so i would guess it has something to do with competition or you've got something coming in during the night and eating i mean you just don't know it i have a comment i have trillium in my yard that must have gotten there by birds quite wet in that area another well, comment. that fleshy fruit with milk go ahead no, you can see they have that fleshy fruit with multiple seeds in it. I, that, that could be bird dispersed also. I uh, have another raised hand from Joe. So you're unmuted now. You can ask your question. This isn't a question. Uh, this is uh, something I'll share with you. I, I don't know if I should. It might be embarrassing. But uh, in these times, I think everyone's going a little crazy. So I was walking the woods the other day and came a across May apples and I was texting with Debbie and this is what I wrote to her like you know it's not I said walking in the woods I ran into May and I suggested a walk I wish you would she just looked at me as if to say no I'd rather stay so I gave her a hug and said that's okay I'll be on my way and maybe I'll run into June bug and maybe she would like to play today <laughs> anyway that's I'm sorry Sorry for that, but that's uh, like I said, I'm going crazy out here. So thank you. Now you got to put it to music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything goes on Time Talks, okay? So <laughs> okay. do it yourself, poetry. Good deal. <laughs> All right. awesome. bye -bye. Thank you, Joe. Um, you had a comment that there are so many new apps on Plant ID on your phone. It's interesting just to search for them and and search for identifying plants. Some apps are free, some offer additional purchase options. And that's all of the questions in the chat for now. 
uh, feel free to add any more or shoot us an email later. Tom, did you have any parting comments? Well, yeah, I, I, I always say this to students that are in my classes that, that, that you can always send me an email with questions and everyone thinks, well, I don't want to trouble them, but the best emails that I ever get are the emails when someone sends me a picture of a flower or a tree. Most of the other emails are, you know, bureaucratic and things I have to do. And whereas uh, puzzling over a picture of a flower or a tree is is always uh, a joy to me. So, um, yeah, um, just email me and I'll uh, be glad to consider your question. And thank you for coming today. Really, really enjoy enjoy these. It's been, been a surprise to me the way this has all worked out and uh, how people have responded to it. So we'll keep doing them. Got one coming up next week, as a matter of fact, with, uh, with the one on soils, something near and dear to my heart. So I'm looking forward to that one. Well, thank you guys very much for coming. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.